Hello and welcome to Maximum New Order, the first talking book about the band. It was written and researched by Ben Graham, music is by Amanda Thompson, and it's read by Nancy McLean. You can check out our full catalogue on our website at www.chromedreams.co.uk. In Joy Division, we were we really liked the idiot um, and Lust for Life by Iggy Pop, and that was a kind of external musical influence on on um, music of Joy Division. And probably Blue Monday was influenced by um, God, some high energy tracks around at that time. But most of the time, um, I write music personally that that comes from my own imagination and that's not influenced by um, other bands or other types of music. It's impossible to overstate the importance of New Order when talking about the development of British music in the last 30 years. Massively influential, they've always been one step ahead of their own time. The 1980s were dominated by groups expanding upon the slim but peerless body of work created by Joy Division in the late 70s. Yet by then, the surviving members of that group had become New Order and were forging ahead with an electronic fusion of disco, techno and post-punk that would set the standard for future generations to work from. Although the band themselves were absent through most of the 90s, that decade's cross-fertilisation of currents from rave music to indie rock through drum and bass and hip-hop hard metal crossovers was a dialectic informed by New Order's pioneering influence. Perhaps the key to New Order is that they never set out to achieve any of this. None of them were musicians when they started out, and none of them ever learnt to play in any formal sense. They still can't read music or play certain chords on request. Each of them learnt their instrument by coming at it with an open mind and a fresh perspective. Seeing a guitar, or later a keyboard, a sampler, a drum machine or a computer as simply a tool that could be used to generate interesting noises. Working within their limitations and making those very limitations work to their advantage, they quickly created something utterly unique. They couldn't sound like anyone else because they were incapable of doing so, and as such they had no choice but to make something original. In the beginning then was Joy Division. Four young men gathered in North Manchester, inspired by punk's new barbarism, to try and create a violent noise of their own. Utterly honest and lacking in contrivance, Joy Division almost seemed as though they were channeling something greater than the sum of their parts, as though they were mediums for a musical force that came from outside, something primal and instinctive, unforced, unmediated. True genius, in fact. Joy Division's legacy can be felt in everyone from U2 to Nirvana to Radiohead and beyond. And the band's albums are surrounded by an impenetrable mythology of funereal doom and despair, lent credence by the tragic suicide of singer Ian Curtis. None of the members of Joy Division, though, were the serious young men of popular myth. They were hedonists and practical jokers, lads on the pull and on the make, drinking, getting high and having the time of their lives, at least until Ian's illness and subsequent death dragged them all down. But as New Order, they went on to create music arguably even more affecting and memorable than Joy Division's, with songs like Blue Monday, Thieves Like Us, True Faith and 1963. With Joy Division, they'd only allowed one side of their personalities to come out in the music, but New Order gave expression to the human condition in all its complexity. The archetypal New Order sound, high-energy electronic dance music with melancholy melodies and an angst-ridden, if blackly humorous, lyric, represents perfectly the collective sensibilities of the band. Solidly working class, yet aspirational, intellectual and bohemian. They were hedonistic party animals with a deeply sensitive, introverted streak, full of bullish confidence, yet inwardly self-doubting. Beer-swilling football fans with an appreciation of expressionistic art and classical music. New Order are all of these, refusing to conform to any one stereotype in their lives or in their music. Perhaps this is why they've remained so consistently popular, because New Order and their music are just like you or I. Flawed, contradictory, self-empowered, magical and still searching.
I write the music about me and not just lyrics. That is, I, 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 I write it about me and the feelings that I have. I don't listen to like what's happening in the charts and try and write a record like that because um, I, um, I can't do that. Bernard Albrecht was born in 1956 in Salford, the Lancashire industrial town that most people consider merely an insalubrious suburb of Manchester. Certainly in the 1950s and 60s, it was a dark, polluted, claustrophobic place, still shrouded in smog from the factories and mills where the locals worked. The Albrecht family lived in a typical soot blackened terrace until, in the mid-60s, they were moved along with many others into one of the new, clean and modern tower blocks. Their initial sense of literally going up in the world was soon replaced by an awareness that the community had been torn apart, uprooted and destroyed. Bernard, in particular, felt a deep-rooted sense of loss and displacement, which haunted him throughout his teens. This was increased dramatically by the death of his stepfather. His happiest times were visiting his grandparents' old house, where the attic was crammed with memorabilia of World War II. Bernard soon became fascinated with that era. At school, Bernard became friends with Peter Hook, born on the 13th of February, 1956. The two would attend North Salford Youth Club, immersed in the skinhead and soul boy culture of the time. Barney found most rock music too absurdly macho for his tastes. Hook, on the other hand, had a taste for early 70s hard rockers like the Groundhogs and Hawkwind. And when a new band from London called the Sex Pistols, who'd already caused a sensation in the music press, were billed to appear at Manchester's Lesser Free Trade Hall on the 20th of July 1976, they both decided to go along. The Lesser Free Trade Hall was actually a small room above the main hall, and the gig was sparsely attended. But many of those who were there would go on to create the cream of Manchester's musical future. These included the Buzzcocks, Morrissey and Granada TV anchorman and future Factory Records founder, Tony Wilson. Hook and Albrecht were not alone in leaving the show with the urge to form a band of their own. Although, as they later admitted, the inspiration was less a musical one and more the fact that punk rock looked like something anyone could do and a great deal of fun to boot. They initially formed the group with another school friend, Terry Mason, who became their first drummer. Pete and Bernard both wanted to be guitarists, but since Albrecht was the only one of them who'd picked up the instrument before, he got the plum job, and Hooky became the bassist by default. He developed his distinctive style, playing high up on the neck, because he claimed that was the only way he could hear himself during rehearsals. None of the three wanted to be the singer though, and so they decided to approach a guy they'd often seen at gigs, who wore an old army jacket with hate painted across the back. This was Ian Curtis, a married man with a steady job, who was nevertheless an enthusiastic convert to the punk scene. If anything, he'd been ahead of his time, an early fan of punk precursors Lou Reed and the Velvet Underground, Iggy Pop and the Stooges, the MC5 and David Bowie. Curtis was the son of a transport police detective and had been expelled from grammar school in Macclesfield, Cheshire for experimenting with sniffing glue and taking sedative drugs like barbiturates and Valium. He had an idyllic rural childhood, yet was drawn towards music, books and films that depicted a harsh, mechanised industrial world. He was also, like Bernard, obsessed with World War II and the Nazis in particular. Curtis was already writing poems and short stories and had been looking for a way to become involved in the exploding punk scene. He jumped at the chance to sing with the band and sought advice from the fledgling Buzzcocks on how to go about making the group happen. It was Pete Shelley who gave them their first name, the Stiff Kittens, and Curtis who convinced Hookie and Bernard to take the enterprise seriously and to put in six months of rigorous practice before their first gig. Ian Curtis was determined that one day the whole world would know his name. We'd all been through so much together, you know, we've been through the death of Ian Curtis. Uh, various, very strenuous things, another death of our producer, a, a nervous breakdown amongst someone who, someone who worked for us, and, and extreme business 
Lords and gang related problems in Manchester. We've been through all this and then, then we'd not survived at the end of it. It was a bit sad really. By May 1977, the Stiff Kittens had become Warsaw, named after a track on David Bowie's Low album. They also had a new drummer in Stephen Morris, another Macclesfield lad who'd been in the year below Curtis at school. Morris answered an ad in a Manchester music shop and met Warsaw in Strangeways car park, where he wondered if the sinister-looking trio had just been released from the notorious jail. Their first gig was at Manchester's Electric Circus, supporting the Buzzcocks and Penetration, and in October they were recorded live at that same venue for a compilation album entitled Short Circuit, released on Virgin the following summer. Tony Wilson described Warsaw as a cacophony with a great lead singer, but even he had to admit they'd improved dramatically by the time they played a Battle of the Bands contest at Rafters Nightclub in April 1978. By this time, they were known as Joy Division, a name Curtis had taken from a pulp novel called House of Dolls, and which referred to the female prisoners in concentration camps kept for the Nazi officers' sexual use. At the show, Curtis berated Wilson for not putting them on Granada's What's On, which had given TV exposure to many local and punk bands. Joy Division bombed at the contest, going on last after most people had gone home. But Wilson was impressed with their energy and attitude, as was the club's DJ, Rob Gretton, who later approached the group about becoming their manager. They accepted, and Gretton would guide their career for over 20 years. In June, Joy Division put out their first record, a 7-inch EP on their own Enigma label. Limited to a 1,000 pressings, An Ideal for Living featured four songs, Warsaw, Leaders of Men, Failures and No Love Lost. 1,200 12-inch singles featuring the same tracks followed in October. In September, Tony Wilson finally put Joy Division on the telly, performing the song Shadow Play. Wilson had also decided to sign the band to the new independent label he'd just started, Factory Records. Joy Division contributed two songs to the Factory Sampler double 7-inch package in January 1979 and recorded their first John Peel session in the same month. Then in June, they released their debut album, Unknown Pleasures, to poor sales and mixed reviews. Sounds called it music to commit suicide to, but Melody Maker hailed it as one of the best debuts of the year. It reached number 71 on the charts. Unknown Pleasures has since been recognised as a classic, and within a year of its release, dozens of bands would use it as a blueprint to create a whole genre known as gothic rock, a phrase Tony Wilson originally coined to describe the stark, melodramatic beauty of Joy Division's music. At the time, however, it sounded like nothing else, despite owing something to Iggy Pop's 1977 LP, The Idiot, and the metronomic drum beats of Kraftwerk. But no one sounded like Ian Curtis, whose enigmatic, unsettling lyrics spoke of alienation, dread and despair over a bleak, paranoid soundscape largely created by visionary producer Martin Hannett. Hannett's use of compression, reverb and ambient sound effects added to the spare, minimal playing of the band, and he was instrumental in convincing Morris in particular to play in a unique, stripped-down fashion, relying on bass and snare with hardly any use of cymbals. With no real verses or choruses, songs like She's Lost Control and Insight built and unfolded, then finally faded away without resolution. Taut and danceable, they nevertheless conveyed a nightmarish sense of introspection, violence and suppressed panic. By the time the single Transmission was released in October 1979, the band had built up an intense and loyal following, thanks also to a six-week nationwide tour opening for the Buzzcocks. But in December, Ian Curtis had an epileptic seizure following the band's first London gig, and the medication he was prescribed not only failed to control the ever-increasing attacks, but caused him to have violent and unpredictable mood swings. His on-stage dancing simulated and almost seemed to invite seizures so that often, band and audience alike couldn't tell if he was having a fit or not. In March 1980, Joy Division released a limited edition single on the French Sordide Sentimental label, Atmosphere, backed by Dead Souls, and were in Britannia Row Studios in London recording their second album. 
But Curtis was further troubled by an affair he was having with a Belgian woman he'd met on tour. And though he still loved his wife Deborah, as well as their newborn daughter Natalie, the couple were by now living apart. In the early hours of Sunday the 18th of May 1980, 23-year-old Ian Curtis hung himself at home in Macclesfield on the eve of Joy Division's first American tour. Weeks later, the band's new single, Love Will Tear Us Apart, reached number 13 in the UK charts. But with Ian Curtis dead, Joy Division no longer existed. There are two sad things about the fact that we'd, we'd, we'd not actually split up, but that we were never going to get back together again. One was we had a great legacy of songs that we'd spent a lot of time and sweat writing over the years, and we, we could never um, play them again. You know, and so you'd lost this legacy, and we'd already lost the legacy once in Joy Division, we'd lost all the songs. It was a good feeling that we could possibly play these songs again. As Joy Division's posthumously released second album, Closer, climbed to number six in the charts, the remaining members were still coming to terms with their singer's sudden death. Factory boss, Tony Wilson, convinced them to go back into their rehearsal studios and go straight back to work. The most pressing question, however, was who was going to sing now that Ian was gone? Although the band briefly considered bringing in Simon Topping, the singer with fellow factory band A Certain Ratio, who'd stood in for Ian at a Joy Division concert once when Curtis was too ill to perform, they soon decided that they couldn't possibly replace him with an outsider. None of the band had any desire to become the lead singer, but Bernard eventually got the job purely because as the guitarist, he played less than the other two. A new name was also needed, as the four had always agreed that if any one of them left, they would stop using the name Joy Division. Several were considered, the shortlist supposedly including the likes of Barney and the JDs, Black September, the Sun Valley Dance Band and the Witch Doctors of Zimbabwe. But eventually, and perhaps thankfully, the self-explanatory New Order won the day. It was also around that time that Bernard underwent a name change. At the beginning of Joy Division's career, he had briefly called himself Bernard Dickin before returning to Albrecht. But in new order, he adopted the name Sumner. All he will say on the matter is that the changes were for family reasons. He would also start using his long-standing nickname, Barney, in a professional context, as new order consciously tried to move away from the serious doom and gloom mythology that the media was already starting to erect around Joy Division. New Order played their first show as a three-piece at Manchester nightclub The Beach on the 29th of July 1980. Gone were all the old Joy Division songs, with the exception of the last two songs they'd written together, Ceremony and In a Lonely Place. These were released as New Order's debut single in January 1981. The A-side was an instant classic, with a repetitive, chiming guitar riff over driving bass and drums. Ironically, some journalists criticised Barney for not being as good a songwriter as Ian, not realising that Curtis had actually written the lyrics to both songs. New Order re-recorded Ceremony when they expanded to a four-piece in June, with the addition of Stephen Morris's girlfriend, Gillian Gilbert, on guitar and keyboards. Gillian, who was born in Manchester on the 27th of January 1961, had stood in for an injured Barney at a Joy Division show in Liverpool, and was an ideal choice to flesh out the group, as she was already part of their inner circle and wasn't about to upstage them as a musician. Her guitar playing would free up Barney to concentrate on singing, while the addition of a full-time keyboard player emphasised New Order's increasing electronic direction, a path they'd been travelling down since the early days of Joy Division. It was actually in Curtis who'd introduced the others to the purely electronic music of bands like Can and Kraftwerk, and had convinced Barney to buy his first synthesizer, 
which the group had used on stage throughout the first half of 1980, and which had dominated their second LP with washes of atmospheric sound. New Order's next two singles, Everything's Gone Green and Temptation, were a further step towards electronic textures and the dance floor, while our debut album, Movement, was perhaps, unsurprisingly, a dark, brooding affair that nevertheless foreshadowed the electronic sound to come. Washes of guitar and synthesizer intermingled over stark, brutal drum fills. While Barney was still nervously attempting to imitate Ian Curtis in both his lyrical and singing style, only Dreams Never End conveyed any sense of hope or optimism, while the rest suggested only loss and mourning. Yet Movement was a brave, honest and experimental album, from a band struggling both to come to terms with their recent past and to understand how to move forward. A transitional record that was very different from either Joy Division or the band New Order would become, Movement was also the group's last, with producer Martin Hannett. The final straw came when Hannett had Barney sing the vocal part to ICB over 40 times without telling him what it was he was doing wrong. After the 40th take, Barney went into the control room to find it empty. After telling him to just keep on singing, the autocratic, eccentric producer had simply gone home. An undoubted genius, Hannett was also a heroin user, and in 1982 he sued Factory for monies owed and went into seclusion returning to the label to produce the Happy Mondays bummed LP in 1988 before dying of heart failure in 1991, aged 41. Uh, no, we're very. We're. Uh, we, I think we're. We're. We're happy with our lot. Happy with our lot. There's been ups and downs, you know, like life is. It's full of ups and downs. Maybe this is an up, or maybe it's a down. Who knows? Okay, we, who we, knows? We, we will never know. Well, we'll, we'll probably find out. Really, we, we, yeah, yeah, yeah. In September 1980, New Order embarked on a brief American tour, and in New York, had all of their equipment stolen, none of which was insured. They then received a huge tax bill for US sales of Joy Division Records and found that their American record label had gone bust without paying them. The tax bill was substantially reduced, however, as a result of Tony Wilson and Rob Gretton convincing New Order to invest in Factory Records' latest venture, a Manchester nightclub to be called the Hacienda. The Hacienda was inspired by New York nightclubs such as the Danceteria and Studio 54 with their clean lines, modernist architecture and fashionable yet arty clientele. The first clubbers to use ecstasy as a recreational drug for dancing and going out. The soundtrack to these clubs was high energy, minimalist Italian disco, created by producers like Bobby O and following in the footsteps of pioneers like Giorgio Moroder who'd crafted state-of-the-art hits for Donna Summer such as I Feel Love. New Order were also much taken with this sound and on their return attempted to recreate it and incorporate it into their own music. The result, recorded in October 1982 and released in March the following year, was Blue Monday, the biggest selling 12-inch single of all time. With its seminal drum sound, the result of the band messing around with a newly purchased drum machine for the first time, Blue Monday was a sensation catapulting New Order onto Top of the Pops, where they insisted on playing live rather than miming and turned in a charmingly ragged performance. Not only had Barney finally found his own voice as a singer, but with this groundbreaking fusion of New York disco with Manchester post-punk, of alienation with ecstasy, New Order had created their signature tune and set a benchmark for the decade. Ian McCulloch of Echo and the Bunnymen called it intelligent dance music, while Neil Tennant, then a smash hits journalist, was jealous that New Order had got there first, combining the same obsessions that he would later bring to his own musical project, the Pet Shop Boys. 
Blue Monday also came in a striking sleeve, designed by Factory's in-house artist Peter Saville. Inspired by a piece of then brand new technology, the floppy disk, the packaging was actually so expensive that Factory lost money on every copy of the record sold. So, three million sales later, Blue Monday actually left the company significantly worse off for its biggest hit. New Order's second album followed in May 1983. Power, Corruption and Lies was housed in an equally memorable Peter Saville sleeve, with a floral arrangement in oils on the front cover and another floppy disk inspired design on the back. This featured a colour wheel based on the shades used in the cover painting that enabled you to discover the album's title by decoding the strips of coloured blocks that ran along the right-hand edge of the inner sleeve. From the driving indie rock of Age of Consent to the propulsive Leave Me Alone, in which Barney's fragile vocals are submerged beneath droning, jangling guitars and Morris's steam train drumming, New Order's second album is the one where they really find their own direction. If movement were a coda to the Joy Division era, then Power, Corruption and Lies sees New Order embarking on their own journey, with Barney, in particular, finding his own voice as a singer and a lyricist. Of special note is the synthesizer and melodica-led Your Silent Face, with its classic payoff line, You caught me at a bad time, so why don't you just piss off? On We All Stand, Barney repeats the ominous phrase, at the end of the road, over a foreboding, creeping funk groove. Ultraviolence is melancholy tribal funk with choppy, phased guitars, while Ecstasy is a cinematic semi-instrumental with the vocals obscured by a vocoda. Most interesting is 586, which after a strange, squelchy instrumental opening, fades into a sequencer-led groove that's a close cousin of Blue Monday, complete with minimalist drum machine breakdown in the middle. It also sounds very like The Walk by The Cure, which was released as a single later in the same year, a fact which didn't escape New Order's attention. Power, Corruption and Lies, along with Blue Monday, finally saw New Order escaping from Joy Division's shadow to be recognised as innovators and artists in their own right. They were the first of a run of releases which would see the band become one of the three most important alternative groups of the 1980s, alongside The Smiths and The Cure, epitomising the spirit and idealism of independent rock music throughout the decade. The satisfaction about Blue Monday, uh, from our point of view, was that the actual record, because of the sleeve, the cut-out sleeve, that uh, Peter Savile did actually cost 10p more than we could sell it for. So Tony Wilson took great delight in telling us that not only was it the biggest selling 12-inch of all time, but it actually cost us 10p to put out <laughs> each copy, <laughs> which just about sums up how ironic factory records were. Mm, it's a hell of a lot. And people wonder why we're skint. <laughs> August 1983 saw New Order release the single Confusion. Perhaps even more so than Blue Monday, it embraced current dance floor sounds and was produced by legendary New York DJ Arthur Baker. In addition, a plethora of remixes were available across the various formats of the single, a tradition that New Order would maintain on each subsequent release. New Order were not only pioneers of the 12-inch single format throughout the 1980s, they were also at the forefront of remix culture, delighting in handing over their songs to outside DJs and producers to be refashioned and reinterpreted. Sometimes the results were more successful than at others, and many were critical of the treatment that Confusion in particular received. But if New Order's brief as a band wedding the popular to the avant-garde was to experiment, then one has to expect the results to fall flat on their face from time to time. As Peter Hook said on the subject, not everything has to be perfect. Each single would also come in a variety of sleeves, all variations on an initial design by artist Peter Saville. These were often notable for not actually featuring the name of the group or the song in question, 
But while some dismissed this as pretentious, others recognised it as New Order's way of setting themselves apart from the herd. Each release was designed as a thing of subtle beauty, and the band certainly never had any desire to feature photographs of their own faces on the cover of each new release. They would rather have a complete piece of artwork, uncluttered by text, available in a series of slightly different limited edition prints. New Order's next release was another classic, regarded by many fans as their finest ever single. Indeed, the band would often agree with the Cognoscenti in placing it above Blue Monday. Thieves Like Us, released in April 1984, was an anthemic love song with a classic Peter Hook bass line inspired by the hot chocolate song, Emma. A love song to the idea of love and the notion that it belonged at once to nobody and everybody. Thieves Like Us found a special place in many people's hearts. New Order kept up the high standards on their third album, 1985's Low Life. Regarded by many as their most representative LP, it was the first New Order album to have a single lifted from it, and in fact spawned two. The Perfect Kiss in May and Subculture in November. The album came in a typically striking and contrary sleeve, and, after all this time, a New Order record finally featured photographs of the band. Not all of them, though. A black and white shot of drummer Stephen Morris filled the front, while Gillian could be seen on the back, and the whole record was wrapped in heavy tracing paper, obscuring the photos and creating a distancing effect and an aura of mystery. Low Life saw New Order move even further away from the dark, edgy minimalism of Joy Division towards what would become New Order's trademark sounds, stabbing synths, anthemic choruses and sequenced drum machine rhythms combined with Morris's epiphanic live drum rolls. Yet in other ways, the album was a return to the intelligent pop music which Joy Division could excel at. High-energy techno-funk coupled with abrasive guitars, Low Life featured classic New Order tracks like the single that never was, Love Vigilantes, and the powerful, atmospheric instrumental, Elegia, apparently edited down from its 20-minute original form. In March 1986, New Order recorded the song Shell Shock for the John Hughes teen movie Pretty in Pink, where it appeared on the soundtrack alongside songs from The Psychedelic Furs, The Smiths, and Echo and the Bunnymen. Then, in September 1986, came the album Brotherhood, featuring the singles Bizarre Love Triangle and State of the Nation. New Order's Grey album was divided roughly into guitar-based songs on side one and more electronic numbers on side two, although opener, Paradise, was a mixture of both, throwing in a nod to Dolly Parton's Jolene for good measure. Standout track Broken Promise was something of a Joy Division throwback, while Every Little Counts was notable for the lyric I think you are a pig, you should be in a zoo. Yet the album disappointed critics and many fans, coming perhaps too soon after the classic Low Life to stand up as a great record in its own right. But with two albums and six singles released over a two-year period, 1984-86 to 86 had been an incredibly productive time for New Order. After Brotherhood, it would be three years before the group's next album of all new material. Yeah, we on this label, Factory Records, in yes. the early days, and uh, in their dictionary, business dictionary, the uh, P section was missing, so when it came to promotion, they didn't know what it was. <laughs> oh, I thought you meant personality. Could be a bit of a de deficit in that department as well. We never did any promotion. In 1987, Factory Records released Substance, a double album collecting together the 12-inch mixes of all of New Order's singles to date. Temptation and Confusion were featured in new mixes and the album concluded with a brand new single, True Faith. Co-produced and co-written by Pet Shop Boys producer Stephen Haig, True Faith was classic New Order, a sublime melody set to a driving, pulsing rhythm, with Barney singing from the point of view of a heroin addict regretting a lifetime of missed opportunities. 
True Faith was New Order's biggest hit since Blue Monday, partly thanks to a striking, award-winning video. The single also featured one of New Order's finest ever songs tucked away on the B-side, the haunting, melodramatic 1963, with its mysterious refrain, Johnny, don't point that gun at me. Blue Monday was also re-released in March 1988, remixed by Michael Jackson producer Quincy Jones, to whose Quest record label the band had just signed in the States. While many fans thought Blue Monday 88 an abomination, insisting that one shouldn't mess around with perfection, it did give the song a new lease of life on radio and television and consolidated New Order's status as a mainstream pop group. New Order followed up True Faith with the December 1987 single Touched by the Hand of God, taken from the soundtrack to the Italian film Salvation. This also featured several other New Order tunes unavailable anywhere else, including Let's Go, Sputnik and Skull Crusher. A 1987 world tour included appearances at the Glastonbury Festival and a date at Wembley Arena on the 10th of December, as well as seeing the band playing Love Will Tear Us Apart live for the first time as an encore in Australia. 1989 saw them play a celebratory homecoming at Manchester's G-Max Arena, then embarking on a three-month American tour before returning to the UK for a triumphant headlining appearance at that year's Reading Festival. Somewhere along the way, New Order had transformed themselves from shy, reticent performers into a crowd-pleasing live act, with a back catalogue of stadium-sized anthems and a neat line in sarcastic, self-deprecating banter. This change was as much to do with improved technology as growing self-confidence, as playing live with electronic equipment had been a nightmare in the early 80s. While other bands relied on backing tapes, New Order had insisted on playing everything live, a task that required a huge amount of concentration. Inevitably, something always went wrong or broke down during a live show, the experience of which gave the band their reputation for being nervous, distracted performers. New Order's shift from long, raincoated prophets of angst and alienation to hedonistic lads about town was finally completed in 1990, when the band had their first, and only, number one single. World in Motion was that year's official World Cup theme song, recorded with the England football squad. Football songs have a long and ignominious history in Britain. Who can forget such classics as Back Home by the 1970 England World Cup squad, or indeed players Glenn Hoddle and Steve Waddle's 1987 single, Diamond Lights. While it may not be New Order's finest recorded moment, World in Motion is certainly the only credible football song ever, despite launching comedian Keith Allen of Fat Les fame on his mercifully brief pop career and featuring England player John Barnes' woeful rapping. Barney's chorus of Love's Got the World in Motion tries desperately to steer things back onto a more romantic ground, but the refrain of we're singing for England, England, is probably more to the point. And the song's original title of E for England would have more neatly summed up the interface of club culture, recreational drug use, football and reclaimed patriotism that the song was celebrating, a snapshot of a moment in time that New Order had rightfully claimed as their own. Those days of uh, the punk ethic, when you, you, the whole idea was to let the music speak for itself, you know. And the thing is, is that on the first few uh, interviews we were doing, I mean, I, and it was an idea the, Gu the Guardian did to put, a, you know, an established group with a young group. And I understood why we didn't talk when we were younger, because you don't really have the confidence, or you don't know what you're talking about, you know. You just—it was such a change to go from one minute of just being what you consider yourself as to be normal. And then just because you're in a group and play music, everyone thinks you've got something to say. And I think that while maybe some of them have something to say, some of them you know, don't. They just do it for the music. In the years since New Order had released their last original album in 1986, British music had undergone a seismic sea change. In 1987, DJs Paul Oakenfold and Danny Rampling, among others, 
had started playing a style of music they called Balearic after the Ibiza nightclubs where they'd first experienced DJs playing lengthy sets of different styles of music to euphoric crowds, united by the rush of the then underground dance drug Ecstasy. The effect of Ecstasy soon spread to the football terraces as well, as throughout 1988 and 89, many soccer hooligans briefly swapped the rush of violence for the buzz of the new designer drug. Meanwhile, house music from Chicago and Detroit, characterised by repetitive electronic bass drum, sampled, dislocated vocals, and either a vamping piano riff or the acid squelches of an abused Roland 303 drum machine, was making serious inroads into the UK charts, alongside homegrown, sample-heavy, breakbeat records like Pump Up the Volume and S Express. And by the summer of 1988, the press and media were engineering a full-scale moral panic over the so-called acid house raves, fueled by the demon drugs of ecstasy and LSD. DJs in New Order's home city of Manchester had picked up on the house music as early as 1986, as the new sounds of Detroit were championed by the same enthusiasts of imported black American dance music as had created the northern soul scene of the early 70s. The Hacienda was one of the first venues to dedicate regular nights to the new sound, and by the summer of 1988, its Balearic and Acid House nights were legendary, with Happy Monday singer Sean Ryder adopting the role of ecstasy dealer in residence, turning everyone on to the new vibe. In Manchester, the summer of 1988 was known as the Second Summer of Love, and the city's new reputation as the hedonistic hate ashbury of the late 80s soon spread nationwide. By 1989, it had been popularly renamed Madchester. Two bands, both essentially psychedelic indie rock groups, turned on to the possibilities of dance culture were at the forefront of this musical explosion. The Happy Mondays had started out as a Joy Division covers band and had signed on to Factory Records in 1986. Barney Sumner had even produced a couple of their early singles. The Stone Roses, meanwhile, had their early single, Elephant Stone, produced by Peter Hook. Elsewhere in Manchester, 808 State and a guy called Gerald produced groundbreaking British techno music that owed much to New Order's pioneering work. Barney even guested on 808 State's XL album. New Order were then excellently placed to see which way the wind was blowing in 1988. Within a few months, their 80s indie contemporaries, the Smiths, The Cure, Echo and the Bunnymen, and so on, would either have split up or be sounding tired and obsolete. Determined to avoid this fate, or perhaps more determined to share in the good times that were very much in evidence, New Order decamped to Ibiza to record their fifth album. It was Hooky who'd scouted out the location, and on the basis of his report that the studio was dreadful, but it had a pool and a bar, the band moved out there for several months. The results were a lot of clubbing, sunbathing, drinking and general hedonism. Oh, and a few basic drum tracks. Tony Wilson called it the most expensive holiday they'd ever had, but in truth, the experience was invaluable. While the majority of the album was finished off at Real World Studios in Bath, the Ibiza sessions informed every note of the final product and gave the group a whole new attitude and lease of life. Technique, released in February 1989, found New Order sounding utterly contemporary and on top of their game. It opened with the album's first single, Fine Time, with Barney growling, you're much too young to mess around with me, over Chicago house rhythms, vocal samples and cut-up beats. Here was New Order showing the youngsters how it was really done, in full mastery of the new technology and sounding more confident than they ever had before. And that's without even mentioning Hookie's tongue-in-cheek Barry White impression and a fade-out featuring assorted farmyard noises. All the way, rode in on a bass line reminiscent of The Cure's Just Like Heaven, though New Order were by now leaving their old rivals eating their dust. Round and Round, the second single, was glistening, perfect New Order techno-pop, all brash, synth stabs and an underlying melancholy. Guilty Partner was taut and edgy, dark yet danceable, while third single, Run, 
featured some of Barney's most impressive guitar playing to date. Also of note was dance floor classic Vanishing Point, which was used as the theme to the BBC TV drama Making Out. Technique saw New Order at the peak of their powers, and the album vies only with Low Life to be considered the band's finest LP. Appropriately, it went to number one immediately upon release. New Order were on top of the world, but it was all about to come crashing down around them. Because I guess all the animosity had, had burnt out of us, really. I mean, we'd, we'd been on tour so much together that we all, quite frankly, got on each other's nerves. Um, plus, we had um, business pressures, really severe business pressures, which aggravated the situation. And um, I guess four years of thinking that we were never going to play together again kind of cleared the air. You know, extremely clear the air because we we get better now than we ever did. Things started to go wrong in summer of 1989. In June, 16-year-old Claire Layton collapsed and died at the Hacienda, the country's first ecstasy-related death. The so-called second summer of love was turning sour, and the situation worsened in 1990 when Madchester turned into Gunchester. The increasingly lucrative drugs trade was taken over by organised criminal gangs and inter-turf warfare frequently erupted into fatal gunfights and stabbings. The Hacienda was at the centre of the conflict as rival drug dealers began bringing guns into the club and threatening staff and management. In January 1991, the Hacienda voluntarily closed its doors and despite briefly attempting to reopen in the summer, closed for good shortly after. Burnt out from touring and their own excesses, New Order were badly in need of a holiday. Instead, as major shareholders in the Hacienda, they were dragged into endless business crisis meetings. New Order had always felt that the Hacienda was an albatross around their necks, a black hole into which all their money disappeared. They would frequently complain that in 10 years of funding the place, they never got so much as a free drink out of it. Yet now, Tony Wilson told the band that the only way that the club and factory itself could be saved was for New Order to record a new album that was guaranteed to sell a million and fast. The only trouble was, by this time, the band members were exhausted and sick of the sight of each other. The pressure was tantamount to factory holding a gun to their head. And Gillian suggested at the time that they should have gone on strike or at least taken a year off to sort out all their problems. Many have criticised Republic as being New Order's weakest album, yet under the circumstances, it's a miracle it came out sounding as good as it did. Produced with a high-gloss sheen by Stephen Hay, Republic opened with a gorgeous pop single, Regret, as fine a song as New Order have ever put their name to, and followed it with three further tracks that were released as singles, Ruined in a Day, World, The Price of Love, and Spooky. The album's high point, though, was Special, a stately, melancholy gem which many compared to Massive Attack's Unfinished Sympathy, and which, along with the understated instrumental Avalanche, brought Apache album to a spectacular conclusion. Yet, whatever its merits, the album came too late to save Factory. The label filed for bankruptcy in November 1992, halfway through recording, with New Order still waiting to be paid for technique. The reasons for the label's demise were numerous. Factory were never too hot with finances, and for years New Order had been the only band on the label that had actually sold records. Latterly, the Happy Mondays had also provided hits, but the protracted recording of their disastrous Yes Please album in Barbados, with Sean Ryder becoming addicted to crack cocaine in the process, was a major contributor to Factory's collapse. There was also Dry Bar, which had opened in May 1989 and which was packed at weekends but empty and losing money through the week. And then the property market collapsed, just as Factory had invested in some buildings that proved to be worth substantially less than they thought they were. 
Famously, Factory never signed contracts with any of its artists. Yet in the midst of chaos, New Order came across a signed document which stated that the band owned all rights to all of the music they'd recorded. The lawyers and bailiffs were dumbfounded. Not only did New Order effectively own all of Factory's assets, but they were completely free to walk away, which they did. London Records offered to pay the band the money they were owed for Technique and to finance the completion of Republic. The label finally released the album in May 1993. London Records cashed in on their acquisition of the New Order back catalogue by issuing two unnecessary best-of compilations while the band were sent out on tour. This, however, only increased the growing strain between the members, and Barney also fell ill whilst on the road in America. The band had begun travelling to concerts in separate cars and falling out over petty things. Barney remembered that the way Hooky ate an apple or a packet of crisps would drive him to distraction. When the tour ended in July, it was Hooky who announced he was leaving the band, telling Barney that if he never saw his face again, it would be too soon. However, he was obliged to rejoin New Order for their headlining set at the 1993 Reading Festival. As soon as they left the stage, though, all four went their separate ways without so much as a goodbye. It would be nearly five years before they even spoke to each other again. We, we were happy playing music, but unhappy and uncomfortable talking. And even though Ian valiantly tried, you know, to fill the, the gap, we, we just were happy to sit back and let the music talk, which is what we did. And because we were on Factory Records, as Steve says, we, we were allowed that luxury. And, and in many ways, I think it allowed you to become stronger in yourself and maybe, you know, to have more thoughts about what you were doing b before you actually had to talk. Mm. Barney Sumner and Johnny Marr, the brilliant guitarist from fellow Manchester band The Smiths, had first worked together in 1983. But it was in 1989 that the pair formalised their partnership, coming together as dance rock duo Electronic and releasing the sublime single Getting Away With It on Factory, a song that also featured pet shop boy Neil Tennant on vocals. These three high-profile names working together ensured that Electronic got plenty of TV and press coverage, and the record captured the spirit of the times perfectly, albeit with a somewhat distant sophistication that eluded most of its peers. It climbed to number 12 in the charts, and was followed by an equally successful debut album, the eponymously titled Electronic, that got to number 2. Two more top 20 singles followed in 1991, Get the Message and Feel Every Beat, while the 1992 album, Disappointed, reached number six. This featured six tracks written with Carl Bartos of Kraftwerk, and Neil Tennant returned to the fold on the single Raise the Pressure. Peter Hook formed Revenge in 1990 with guitarist Dave Hicks and keyboard player Chris C.J. Jones, who was the engineer at Sweet 16 in Rochdale, a recording studio that Hook co-owned. Revenge deliberately set out to be a more rock-orientated venture than the increasingly dance-floor-friendly New Order. Hook was also the member of New Order who most enjoyed playing live, and Revenge was a small-scale unit with which he could indulge his love of the road. The band also displayed a curious passion for kinky sex, rubber and motorbikes. Their debut LP, One True Passion, came in a sleeve by former Playboy centrefold-turned-photographer Susie Randall, and featured assorted scantily clad models draped seductively over motorcycles. The band's first gig was at a Skin 2 fetish party, and the LP featured tracks such as Slave, Fag Hag, Kiss the Chrome, and Surf Nazis. After one further EP, 1992's Gun World Porn, Revenge metamorphosed into Monaco, with Revenge's live bass player David Potts taking over on guitar and vocals, and the addition of Mike Hedges on drums and Brian Whitaker joining Hookie on twin bass guitars. On Monaco's two albums, Music for Pleasure, 1997, and Monaco, 2000, Hookie returned to what he did best, writing anthemic pop songs,
featuring his distinctive melodic bass lines, such as the early U2 sounding single, What Do You Want From Me? Not to be left out, Stephen and Gillian formed the wryly named The Other Two and released two albums of electronic, dance oriented pop and soundtrack experiments. These included a couple of noteworthy singles, 1991's Tasty Fish and 1993's Selfish. The pair also finally married after 20 years of dating and moved into a converted Derbyshire farmhouse where they built their own studio and conceived two daughters. Also on the domestic front, Hookie had a brief but well-publicised marriage to comedienne Carolina Hearn before remarrying interior designer Becky Jones. And even Barney settled down with long-term girlfriend Sarah and their two sons and indulged his love of sailing, exploring the Mediterranean on his yacht. But as the 90s passed and Britpop came and went, one thing that everyone was waiting for was the return of New Order. Had they officially split up or not? Would they ever play together again? No one, not even the band, seemed to know the answer to these questions. kind of vampire fashion um, it was quite nice to get somebody young on board I mean what what happened with the way we wrote it was that Bernard Stephen and myself wrote sort of the first half as we thought of ideas and Bernard then went off to work with them but uh, he does take a long time so Stephen and I then enlisted the help of Phil and Phil very helpfully filled in get that Phil filled that, in that's, that's very clever ah, you thank you thank you yeah. it was the band's manager Rob Gretton who was finally responsible for getting New Order back together again. After fielding numerous potentially lucrative requests for the band to play at summer festivals, he faxed the individual members in 1998, asking them to get together and decide once and for all if New Order still had a future or not. It was four very nervous 40-somethings who came back together that day, and the first thing that Barney noticed was that he and Stephen were wearing the same top. He remembered asking the other three if any of them had any problems, and they threw the question back at him, asking if he had any. None at all, Barney recalled saying. Hooky, ever the laconic grouch, piped up that Barney still owed him a tenner. But then, suddenly, everything was fine. The air had been cleared, and none of them could work out what exactly the problem had been, and why they hadn't seen each other for so long. New Order made their triumphant live return on July the 16th, 1998, at the Manchester Apollo, before once more headlining the Reading Festival in August. Both dates were made all the memorable for the band performing several Joy Division songs for the first time since Ian Curtis's death, including Isolation, Love Will Tear Us Apart and Atmosphere. They later explained that when they got back together, it seemed as if Joy Division and New Order had always been the same band all along anyway, despite the years of trying to leave behind their past. They were great songs, they were their songs, and although they were old, from their current perspective, it seemed that if they were going to play Blue Monday from 1983, why not Love Will Tear Us Apart from 1980 as well? This newly relaxed attitude carried over into the recording of New Order's comeback album, Get Ready, at Stephen and Gillian's home studio with producer Steve Osborne. Sadly, Rob Gretton didn't live to see its completion as he died of a heart attack on May the 23rd, 1999, halfway through recording. He was 46, and if anyone was the fifth member of New Order, it was him. The band dedicated the completed album to his memory. Get Ready opened with sombre piano and wordless female soul vocals before crashing into the distorted rock guitars of Crystal. It's immediately obvious that New Order have moved away from the dance floor direction of Technique to make their most rock oriented record ever. The album and subsequent tour even featured Billy Corgan of American goth grunge titans Smashing Pumpkins on additional guitar and he contributed guest vocals to the yearning Turn My Way. Yet this was definitely a New Order record with Hookie's trademark bass lines well to the fore, even if the likes of 60 Miles an Hour and Rock the Shack did sound more like the work of Primal Scream, 
whose Bobby Gillespie and Andrew Innes appeared on the latter. Many complained that so many guest collaborators destroyed the self-contained purity and mystique of New Order. Yet it could be argued that after World in Motion, they had little of that left to lose anyway. If Republic was the sound of a band breaking up and writing to order, then Get Ready is the same band recharged and loosened up. Songs like Primitive Notion update the classic New Order template without ever sounding like self-parody. New Order were back in action, and that was more than enough. I think I think there's a certain amount of tolerance. There's a lot of tolerance. Um, well, definitely have musical differences. I've always wondered what they were actually. <laughs> because you get you always, maybe we could buy some. We could find out. Yeah, yeah. then we could split up. Then. Because they always split up. <laughs> musical differences. Hey, we could do it for Christmas. Maybe we should fly this past Channel Four. <laughs> we should get it packaged as a uh, musical reality differences. A new show. Reality new TV order. show. We could yeah. go around and sort out people's musical differences. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> For Stephen and Gillian, the death of Rob Gretton was followed by further tragedy. First, Stephen's father died, and then the pair's year-old daughter Grace was diagnosed with a rare spinal illness that left her paralysed. She needed round-the-clock care, and there was no way that both her parents could go on tour with New Order and leave her behind. So, reluctantly, after the completion of Get Ready and 20 years of service, Gillian Gilbert left New Order. Her replacement, initially as a live guitarist and later as a full-time member, was Phil Cunningham, late of mid-90s Manchester band Marion. It was with Cunningham that New Order eventually went back into the studio to begin work on the follow-up to Get Ready, 2005's Waiting for the Siren's Call. A variety of producers, including Stephen Street, John Leckie and Stuart Price, trooped down to Stephen and Gillian's Derbyshire studio to record the 11 tracks, which ranged from the opening Who's Joe, which cheekily referenced Jimi Hendrix's Hey Joe, to the punky conclusion of Working Overtime. In between, Animatronic of New York glam disco outfit The Scissor Sisters supplied guest vocals on Jetstream, while first single Crafty reprised elements of New Order's own back catalogue. New Order returned to the scene at a point where a whole new generation of bands most of whom weren't even born when Ian Curtis died, were looking to the music of New Order and Joy Division especially as a major inspiration. Over in America, Interpol, The Rapture, Radio 4, LCD Sound System, The Killers and The Bravery all explicitly took on board elements of Joy Division and New Order. Less obviously, young British upstarts like Franz Ferdinand, Block Party and the Future Heads all cite the band as influencing their sound. Peter Hook's unique and evocative bass playing, Barney's fragile yet enormously expressive vocals and Morris's crisp, precise, minimal drumming remain benchmarks of how pop music should be, nearly 30 years since the trio first started playing together. Emerging from punk rock, and revitalised by Acid House, New Order transcended both those twin musical upheavals and weathered all the minor tremors, post-punk, indie, Britpop, that have occurred around them. With one foot in modern rock and one on the dance floor, always experimenting and always moving on, they remain the definitive British alternative band. New Order have always kept the faith. Thank you for buying Maximum New Order. We hope you enjoyed it. Watch out for further titles on Chrome Dreams coming up soon. If you did enjoy or have any comments or suggestions, write to us at Chrome Dreams, PO Box 230, New Malden, Surrey, UK, KT36YY, or email on mail at chromedreams.co.uk. Details of our full catalogue are listed on our website at www.chromedreams.co.uk. Thanks again for listening and goodbye for now.